recap my neurological resume. <laughs> Asperger's and ADHD is just the tip of the iceberg. I also have dyslexia, dysgraphia, and a whole host of sensory challenges. And in spite of all that, I've managed to author four books, and I have my own business. And the reason I accomplished so much of that, not knowing any of this until I was an adult, is because I had the privilege of being raised by two stubborn mules <laughs> who taught me that if you want something, you go get it. You make it happen. You don't wait around for somebody else to bring it to you. My father was king of the Aspies in our family. <laughs> Nothing could stop him. He would work 12, 15 hour days without eating or even going to the bathroom. I'm not recommending this as a success principle. I'm just giving you an example of how he conducted himself. So what I saw is a man who couldn't be stopped. He wanted to do something, he did it. It was very difficult to make excuses within that context. I also happened to be privileged enough to be a 24 year cancer survivor. So when you are 18 years old and you go through that, it kind of kicks the can out of you. Because when you stare death down and you survive, what on earth do you have to be afraid of anymore? Not a whole lot. So I was able to embrace that and take that into a young adult life, but still having all of these struggles I couldn't explain. Why was it so hard to read a page and absorb the material? Why did I have to read it four and five times and still not know what it said? Why, when I had the best of intentions and tried to connect with other people, did I still never fail to tick them off somehow? Why, when I would compliment a pretty girl, would she say I was being rude? There was a point where I just kind of gave up on friendships and lied to myself and convinced myself that I prefer being alone. I don't need people. That was a lie. I desperately wanted connection. I desperately wanted people. But I resigned myself to not having them in my life. Because every time I tried to bring them in, it hurt. Then I happened to stumble across a fellow wallflower, another nerd out there in the pasture. We found each other and our mutual neediness made us decide to get married. <laughs> the best thing to come out of that marriage was three wonderful young men who happened to all be on the autism spectrum. And the younger two also have ADHD in various varieties. And it was through them that I learned about my own neurological eccentricities. And having to teach them what they need to know to succeed and be effective in this life, when I myself was still incompetent in those areas, required me to step up in a bigger way. Because we all know the school systems are very hit or miss when it comes to this, yes? Some have it together, some are trying, some frankly don't give a crud. So when my kids started out, my oldest one, he was with the not give a crud crowd, who wanted him to be medicated, sit down and shut up. They didn't want to give him sensory accommodations, they didn't want to give him any kind of assistance that would help him manage that space. He effectively imploded. He had meltdowns several times a week, would run from the classroom, and sometimes successfully run from the building. I was called from my day job repeatedly to pick, pick him up and take him home. After a while, I got fed up waiting for them to step up and knew I had to. But first, I had to get to understand myself. What did my own neurological system teach me? How had I made it this far in life without knowing I had all these challenges? Because people ask me that all the time, how did you do it? The psychologist did the assessments on me that helped me pinpoint all of these things. His first question was, how the heck did you get through school? How to get through life? I essentially boiled it down to what I refer to as the three core competencies of life. The three R's. They're not the same as the three R's in school, which are read, remember, and regurgitate. <laughs> <laughs> the three R's I'm referring to our responsibility, resourcefulness, and resilience. So what does responsibility mean? It doesn't mean it's your fault and you better own it. That's blame. That's what our kids typically hear. They are to blame for their negative behavior. People confuse those far too often. 
What does responsibility mean to you? Responsibility means complete ownership of your life, complete ownership of its direction. It means a decision to be proactive, to take steps, to take action, to create things. Not to sit around and wait for them to happen. Not to wait for them to come to you. Responsibility means you own everything happening between your ears, whether there are misfiring circuits or not. You don't blame your challenges, you don't blame the world, you don't blame anything. If you're gonna create something out there in the world, you've gotta own it. Self-advocacy isn't just about asking for what it is you need. Self-advocacy is also preparing to educate the world as to why you need it. Why it's not an excuse. Why it's a justifiable need. And how if that accommodation is granted to you, then everybody wins. The teacher, your peers, whoever benefits from that result. By backing you up, you can be better for them. Then there's resourcefulness. Resources come in three forms. People, places, and things. Michael talked earlier about partnerships. We live in a community, a society. Our number one resource is each other. We were not put on this planet to go it alone. There are times when we allow others to lean on us and times when we must do the leaning. There's this myth out there in the spectrum community that it's weak to ask for help. I work with students over the years who say, my friends don't ask for help, I shouldn't have to either. I look at them stunned and say, what makes you think they don't ask for help? Because I never see them do it. Well, my question to them is, do you ever see them take a shower? No. Is it reasonable to say they do it? Maybe some not as often as they should. <laughs> but you know they do it. You see, your parents ask for help. You yourself ask for help whether you don't know it or not. But asking for help is, again, the number one resource. In fact, I'll give you the universal principle for why help makes us better and why help to each other is why we're here. I call it my rule of complementarity. It goes like this. My strengths are the reasons you need me, and my challenges are the reasons I need you. We're here to complement each other, to balance each other out, to create that unique synergy that we only can when we come together. And that's just utilizing each other's resources. Places. What places can you go that are resourceful to you? Let's say you're in a place that is sensorily overwhelming and you need to get out of there. You go to a place that's more calming. Let's say you've been in an office all day. Again, phones ringing, people getting on your case. You take a nice long walk outside, feel the breeze. <coughs> that is a resource to you. It's a new experience. It touches your senses in a whole new way. Then you have things. Even reference to exercise balls. The ones you can bounce on, the ones that you need to squeeze in your hand. Things can be knowledge. It can be a little pencil that you fidget with. It can be the internet that helps you find the answers that you so desperately need. We are surrounded by resources all the time. Anybody walk here tonight? How'd you get here? You drove. The car was not your only resource. Everybody that was involved in putting that thing together so you could use it are resources to you. You are connected to everybody that was in that chain of events. The people that pumped the oil out of the ground, refined it, shipped it, and brought it to your local gas station and charged you too much for it. Those are all resources to you. Then there's resilience. Resilience is the art of getting up instead of giving up. 
It's about bouncing back and weathering whatever storm life sends your way. Now, I know this is a room filled with youngsters, right? But when you count whatever age you're at now, you must acknowledge that every single day of your life, you got up, and whatever happened to you, you got through. And you got up the next morning, and you kept going. There are so many people I've come across that I can't do it. It's too much. It's overwhelming. I, I, I don't know what to do. Really? Your history contradicts that statement. Your history tells you that every single day you've gotten up and you kicked butt in some way. You found a way to make it work. You took responsibility for getting through that day. You somehow found the resources to allow you to solve those problems or at least hang on. Because maybe that problem isn't going to get solved today. Maybe it'll be tomorrow or even next week. But you at least found the resources to hang on. And you kept going. You bounced back. There's been some conversation tonight about the importance of letting go. There are a lot of things to let go of. One of the most important things is those limiting beliefs. The blame. The can'ts. The excuses. The rationalizations. You cannot build a life on those things. You build a life on your dreams and your passions. Your abilities, your strengths, your confidence. When it comes to branching out into college, then the workplace. We know that as members of the spectrum, we are specialists, not generalists. The educational institutions of our world teach us to be Swiss Army knives. No, we're just a knife. One of the, the best parts of my parents' legacy to me was that they were entrepreneurs. They taught me every day of their lives that you can do the one thing you love and you can monetize it and make a living that way. My dad, who to this day can't have a conversation with more than 10 words or so, wouldn't survive in an office environment on his best day. Probably would not get through an interview. <coughs> but he can navigate anything electrical with complete mastery. He turned that into a career. He raised four kids on it and put me through college. Using his own resourcefulness, his own passion. He also had my mother, who was very ADHD, very social, and could handle the front end. He was able to do his strength. She was able to use her strength. And their unique synergy created that business. I am an entrepreneur. My kids are seeing me be resourceful. They're seeing me not have to necessarily fit the, the understanding of what success looks like in order to make a life for yourself. It isn't about going through interviews. It isn't about wearing a suit and tie and following the story that is typically set for you. That's somebody else's story. We are trailblazers. We are redefining what it means to contribute to this world. Many of us are gonna do it in an entrepreneurial way. There is some giftedness in each of us, especially in this era of mass communication and the internet and whatnot. There's something we can monetize. Somebody who has a fantastic eye for photography can sell us photographs as postcards, as things you would hang on your wall, as things on the side of a mug. And there are websites out there that will help you do that. It's just a matter of thinking more resourcefully, more innovatively. Last thing I want to touch on is the idea of independence. My thinking on this is that independence is a myth. Because when you look at the definition of independence, it means to do without help. How on earth can we possibly succeed without help? I am not speaking to you tonight independent of this microphone. I did not get here tonight independent of my car. I don't achieve anything in my life independent of the people in my life. Success does not occur in a vacuum. It occurs in a context. It occurs in a relationship, in a family, 
in a classroom, in a community. We cannot do it alone. We were not meant to do it alone. We are in it together, and we must be in it together. That's the only way we're going to make it. It's been a privilege talking to you. Thank you.